Welcome to Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba. The programming that you're about to see was taped earlier this year. Clearly, so much has changed since then, and unfortunately, a lot of uncertainty and fear remain. However, the issues and the topics raised in this edition of Lessons in Leadership will still matter once we get through these very challenging and difficult times. So without further ado, Lessons in Leadership. Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato. Right there is my trusted colleague who carries this show every week, Mary Gamba. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I do my best. You do better than that. And by the way, I want to plug the fact that uh, you know now you can uh, catch us not only on the radio on AM 971, mm -hmm. Sundays at, every, at 10 a.m. on News 12 Plus. And by the way, where are the other platforms digitally that people can find us? Oh, everywhere. So we are on Spotify, News 12 Plus, Best of NJ, NJBIA, ROI, NJ.com, uh, Meadowlands Media, also on app, on the AM 970 app. So you can really find us everywhere and anywhere. And then you can also subscribe on Apple Podcast and Google Play. Yeah, but what about at 10 o'clock on News 12 Plus? <laughs> We're not self-promotional. We're not self-promotional. <laughs> what about at 10 o'clock? No, oh, there's one thing missing, though. We got to get my face on the next ad. Oh, it's got to happen. It. Come don't on. Don't push it. Man. All right. So um, 10 o'clock every Sunday on News 12 Plus. You can catch us. At, uh, catch us. Also followed by at 1030 by Think, Think Tank, Tank the, podcast. the Podcast. And 11 o'clock, Brian, what's on? Do you happen to know? Yeah, it's an extra special show called <laughs> Tap Into TV. <laughs> Produced by Brian Brodeur and his team here at East Main Media. <laughs> Listen, we will not be simply promoting for this next half hour. We're actually going to do substantive leadership content. And one of our good friends who lives it every day, he is Dr. Joel Bloom. He's the president of NJIT. How you doing, Joel? Good morning. I'm doing fine, Steve and Mary. This is much more laid back than our normal setup. But with Joel, he's not going to uh, come dressed in anything other than a first class suit and tie. Is that your thing? Uh, it is, although I've recently gone tieless. You uh, have? Uh, occasionally, occasionally. <laughs> when I'm supposed to be somewhere else and I wind up in my office un unplanned, a trip gets canceled. I devote that week to being tieless instead of traveling with the ties and the suits. So by the way, Joe Bloom uh, and NJIT, a longtime partner of the Caucus Educational Corporation, our not-for-profit production company. We've producing, been producing programming for many, many years in cooperation with NJIT. Joe, let, let's, let's do this. You and I had a conversation offline, and by the way, we're taping on the 9th of March. This will be seen later. Trust me, we will connect the issue of leadership and the coronavirus for virtually every leader that comes in on lessons in leadership. We don't know where the situation is going to go, but the question of public health and leadership is huge. By the way, why don't we start with that? As we tape this program right now, again, don't know how things are going to play out. How much of your time as a leader at this great university is tied up in thinking about dealing with this? So we, uh, at NGIT, we have a task force, which probably everyone has at this point in time. It's about four weeks in, in the management of the coronavirus and how do we react to the disruption of the virus. And it's, it's significant. It's significant in teaching the students today and having faculty at, at the school today, as well as staff, uh, we have uh, 40 students um, uh, from Italy on our campus for this semester. We had about 20 in Italy in the prior semester. Uh, we had students come back from the break, the holiday break, from China, India, and elsewhere, as well as from other parts of the United States. So we actually, uh, when we reopened uh, January 3rd, in some cases, we had self-imposed quarantines. You did? Oh, uh, yeah. We've been monitoring faculty and students where they've traveled to. We've had them complete forms. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we partner uh, with St. Michael's Hospital, which is diagonally across the street from us. And You're based in Newark, New Jersey. Newark, New Jersey. Uh, great, great city of Newark, New Jersey. So it's very, very disruptive as we speak. We now have contingency plans for maintaining business, including educating our students, for example, and meeting payroll and paying your bills um, in case we do see an infection, um, uh, a confirmed case of coronavirus in the greater Newark area, 
in somebody within the greater Newark community. So to, here's what it comes down to. And again, the reason we're, we decided to talk about this, even though we don't know how it's going to be played out, Lessons in Leadership is not a news program. It is a program that tries to teach, talk about, learn together about leadership. And whether it's right now the coronavirus, before that it was SARS, before that the- um, MERS. Uh, what was mm -hmm. it? MERS. MERS. Oh, right. Okay, so here's the point. There's going to be, there are going to be different issues that come up. The question I often ask Joel, and we have public health professionals coming on as well, talking about this. Do you ever ask yourself how much is too much information for a leader? You're laughing already, mm -hmm. why? How much do you give? How much do you hold back? How much can people handle without freaking them out? Leadership and communication question, go ahead. Well, I think you've got to be ultimately transparent. The question is, how do you phrase the transparency, what is the language you use? How do you reassure people, whether it's about uh, tuition and fee increases or about uh, a deadly illness like the coronavirus? So you've got to be smart about what you say. You can't, you, we all understand there's only so much that most of us can absorb. And, you know, we always go back to the long lesson of rules of three. Go ahead. Don't exceed three informational items in any presentation. Um, because it's, it's just not, you're not going to get the communication and the understanding that you want from the audience that you're attending to. Is it TMI to sometimes, too much information? Yeah, too much information. And, and what we've tried to do, by way of example, and you can draw the, the analogy anywhere you want, we have a single poke spokesperson on the campus about what one. are we doing one. Okay, so this is interesting. Mary and I have been having this conversation. And again, we'll date ourselves, but the uh, relevance of this will be clear. Do you say to yourself, Joel, in a, in a, whether it's a crisis or a challenging situation, I'm the CEO. By the way, tell folks the footprint of NJIT. I'll give you a chance to plug. Go ahead. The, the footprint of NJIT. Today, we are uh, nearly 12,000 students. We're in our research one university. There's only two others in the state. We're 131 in the nation. Uh, most importantly, and we're a U.S. News and World 100, top 100 universities Stop in the country. Um, most importantly, <laughs> though, and this is what's critically important, we are number one in the nation, Forbes magazine, for educating young men and women who come in lowest socioeconomic uh, monies from their families, uh, 10 years into employment, and they're in the highest quintiles of earnings, number one in the nation for multiple years now. So that's who our students are. And first and foremost, in communicating anything, well, you have to know who you're communicating Absolutely. to, and your student population is critical. By the way, uh, while Joel is bragging about NJIT, I think it's okay, it's in a good way. Do you know that uh, Lessons in Leadership with Steve Adovato and Mary Gamba was picked as the number one leadership podcast in the world? Do you know that, Mary? By you? Yeah, by me. <laughs> <laughs> again, again. I looked at all the again. others. By the way, take a look over Joel's right shoulder. Can we see oh that shot? Oh, my goodness. That Isn't that amazing? Wow, well, what a coincidence. Oh, I'm sorry. The book, <laughs> the book. That's my left shoulder. I, uh, yes. Should I, shall I point stop, to it? Stop. It's, it's embarrassing. Stop. Okay. Point to it again. No, I'm Joel. Go back to the question I asked. So in a crisis, in a challenging situation, again, this is not going to be dated because it's relevant. I've often said to Mary, you know, I'm watching uh, President Trump dealing with a very difficult situation as our president, as a leader of the free world. And I'll, I said, you know what? I don't know if it should only be public health professionals, people who know that stuff really well. Um, or should it be the CEO who's out front? Do you say I have to be out front because I'm the president of NJIT? Or do you delegate that? to someone else. Uh, absolutely not. As the president, I should not be out front. Not? Not on this particular issue. I've got people who are uh, well-informed, informed daily. Uh, they're on, uh, whether it's via any kind of messaging from the state, from the CDC, it's not something I can or should do. So again, a task force, including health professionals, public safety, uh, people who are in touch with other expertise in the in the field of health and and health care. Um, so we uh, and we one one spokesperson and it's somebody who is now consumed with monitoring the information, the local situation, the 
national, international situation. Again, we are in an international university. But I want to be clear, no matter what goes wrong. Oh, well, I'm... <laughs> okay, you're as, an as, answer as, the as, question. Our, as our outstanding pre former, former, former President Truman, the buck stops here. At the end of the day, I have need to make sure these folks are meeting, working, communicating. Uh, so, yes, if you want somebody with a technical background, but not everyone with a technical background is a good communicator. So you need somebody with <laughs> a technical background. It's an understatement. <laughs> but you, you need have, somebody with a technical background. Right, but you have another challenge. You have your audience of students, but then you also have your audience of the parents of those students. Mm -hmm. Do you Absolutely. find that they're really, because especially nowadays, I feel like, you know, being a parent myself, I feel like there's the helicopter phenomenon going on. Do you find that the parents are panicking and that you need to communicate differently to them than you would to the students who are really on campus? By the way, to clarify, Mary's got one um, son who's about to go off. Exactly. And one who's in yeah, the middle freshman, of his high school yeah, career. Exactly, Good. a freshman in high school. So, so. it's fair to share mm -hmm. that Mary fully briefed me about all of this earlier this morning. for which I, did, I you can share. We, we <laughs> engaged in the conversation. And and. There's nothing wrong with helicopter parents. Let, let me be clear about that. Mm -hmm. um, parents, an investment in higher ed, whether you're coming to a public university like NJIT or you're at a private university paying sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, the money is dear. Um, the the average is about a fifth of the income of the family income will go towards some form of higher education if the child is going on right. to higher ed. That's significant. So the fact that they want to know, they want to know that their child is safe, is cared for, is getting an excellent education, is having a top quality experience, that's all on us. That's our responsibility. And you have to communicate directly with I have them. to communicate. We communicate with parents all the time. Um, and we even, I'm not sure how active it is at one time, as we were overcoming some issues about our location uh, and the safety of, of Newark, um, we, uh, we put together a parent task force to keep us informed and to talk to parents coming on campus. And they were superb at it. They speak a different language, even though some of us have raised children, they speak a different language mm -hmm. to parents sending their children off to school at that point in time. So... Um, so yes, transparency, good communicator, uh, know, know what you're communicating about and never speculate. Never, on issues don't hypothesize. Of health. What about if this, this, and this happens? How, how can you answer that question? You don't know all the variables. You don't know. Look, look, I mean, just again, back on the coronavirus, uh, everyone thought it was X and it turns out to be X plus, and now it's X plus plus and- And a well, month from now when this airs, it could be X plus, Plus, minus, we don't know. I, I, you know, a, a major university today announced they were closing at Columbia University. I don't know if you picked up. Did not pick has no, to be my outstanding, outstanding yeah. alma mater. <laughs> um, but they, yeah, they, they, they announced they were closing today um, because they have somebody on the campus who is affected uh, by the coronavirus. And again, you know, what is your business contingency plans, yeah. whether you're General Motors or your NJIT? Um, you have to have them. So we just about have them all in place. The idea that there's, you know, business continuation, yeah. regardless of should uh, any of us stakeholders, whether it's the city or a child or a student coming to us, um, it has is diagnosed with the virus. If you're listening on the audio side, you're listening to Dr. Joel Bloom, who's the president of NJIT, a longtime friend and partner of ours. Let's also disclose that Joel serves on the board of trustees of the Caucus Educational Corporation, our not-for-profit production company. Several years back, I actually started my uh, academic teaching career at NJIT in the School of Business there. Uh, Mary, let folks know where they can find our free articles, all really valuable information about leadership and communication. Go sure. Stand-deliver.com is our website. And also, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors who helped to make this all happen. Oh, really? Yeah, we have actually a nice group of sponsors. So we have Gibbons PC. Uh, we great have law firm in Newark. Great law firm in Newark. We've got Prager Metis. Um, accounting firm. A great accounting firm, uh, New Jersey Resources, Valley Bank, and then the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. So we have a lot of great people that make it happen. Are you implying that we have to uh, bring in sponsors to pay for the show? Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm implying, yes. Yeah. By the way, speaking of, leadership and being an entrepreneur, one of the things about Joel, Joel and I have these annual meetings every year. We have to figure out what kind of programming we're going to do. Um, what makes sense for us and our audience on public broadcasting, what educational value NJIT brings to the table. 
Question. You're an entrepreneur. You're an academic, but you're an entrepreneur. The Voice Summit came, this major Voice Summit came to uh, NGIT two years in a row. Huge, international right, event. Right. Joel is always having, and NGIT is always having new, different, innovative, because our theme is innovation, theirs is as well. How do you constantly, as an entrepreneur, stay ahead of the curve as a leader? Come on. So you, you read everything you can read that you think is relevant and timely. By right? the way, what's timely. the book you're plugging? We'll add it to our well, leadership I, library. I, uh, what got us here will not get us there by uh, Marshall Goldsmith. Um, uh, there's a lot out there. Go ahead. Uh, that happens to be one of them. I like the phrasing because what, say it again. What? what got us here will not get us there. Love it. Which if you, we all know the institutions of higher ed are typically considered um, ivy towers, right? Ivory towers. Um, uh, there's an outstanding people on all of our campuses, faculty, researchers, students, undergraduates, PhDs. But at the end of the day, um, they are seen as being very traditional in a very, very fast moving, unbelievably fast moving uh, marketplace of technology, of knowledge, of uh, global and international relationships and competition. So a university today, particularly a polytechnic university, because of the richness of, again, the, the knowledge of our faculty, the research that's going on, uh, we could talk a little about that, uh, about the equipment we have, about the students who are there. We have to capitalize on that. Yes, we must educate them. But there are, uh, and the worst thing we could do is educate them in some fixed model because we all don't learn the same way. The beauty of being a polytechnic university. What does polytechnic mean? Polytechnic means you're intensely science and technology. Okay. And that's what you do. Uh, you don't do other things, and there are great other areas, disciplines of knowledge that people should have, but that's not what we do. Um, and you've been, you've seen our makerspace probably, right? And we opened the second 10,000 square foot piece of it, sound 20,000 square Getting feet incubators in total. going on where people are developing initiatives and businesses? Go ahead. It's amazing, you know, I, you, it's an infection, the right kind of infection in this conversation about how our faculty and students think about innovation and entrepreneurship. It is an infection of entrepreneurship, of the application of science and technology, of young men and women just thinking about how do they solve problems and what's the beauty of, I think, our focus is how do you improve the quality of life for people living daily? whether it's clean water, whether it's clean air, whether it's accessibility of facilities, um, whether it's, uh, what's well, the late? Well, sorry, sorry for interrupting, after Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, NJIT, very actively involved in trying to find solutions as to how we deal with the potential of this moving forward. Is that an over-exaggeration? No, no, you're absolutely correct. And right now, the latest thing, and it's not the latest as far as being faddish, it's the latest built on years of knowledge and experience, is we're now opening cell and gene therapy laboratories in partnership with the industry right. because that is the newest and the so far for many, many successful treatment of uh, how do you cure cancer or how do you stop the spread of cancer. For a university to be involved in this? Because engineers, um, the beauty of, again, of a polytechnic university, engineers and computer scientists and biomedical engineers and biologists and chemists, they not only can build the best equipment to do the medical procedure, they can build the best instrumentation to monitor the procedure. They work on the implants. They work on the physical therapy, understanding, again, the body is a mechanical electrical system. And if you look at the body as a mechanical electrical system, who better to think about it than biomedical engineers who are part mechanical, part electrical, uh, part biology. So yeah, we're, we're immersed in, in the health and life sciences, along with building successful structures, smart building, smart highways, smart cars, um, clean environment, clean environment. Got so. a minute left with Dr. Joel Bloom, Steve Adubato here. This is Lessons in Leadership with my uh, co-host. Executive producer, Mary Gamba, a uh, minute left. Ready, Joel? I've asked you this five times so far. I'm going to do it again. Number one leadership lesson you have learned over the years is? You've got to take care of your people. 
number one leadership challenge, taking care of your Take people. Take care <laughs> of your people. <laughs> <laughs> Easier said than done? Oh, almost impossible. But you well, can't you're, you're, in, in any organization. Yep. Uh, you know, we all come. We all. So one of the best training programs I ever went to was uh, so, uh, a psychoanalytic approach to managing large organizations. Um, there are several institutes. One of them, the A.K. Rice Institute. This is several decades ago. And now that you understand that everyone who's going to walk through that door is walking through that door somewhat fully formed their behavior, their experiences. How do you integrate them into your organization and your goals and their goals yep. somewhat mesh? Easier said than done. By the way, speaking of people being satisfied, satisfying your people, making them um, feel good about what they're doing, I just wanna uh, go on the record to say that Mary Gamba, the co-host and executive producer of Lessons in Leadership, had one of the most successful negotiations this year with me when it came to her annual bonus. Um, I learned from the best. I am still working out from under this. I want to say that 20 years ago when she started asking for her annual whatever, um, she was very nervous. Her neck would get red. She was anxious. This time my neck was red. I was anxious because I knew that she was going to get what she wanted. Mm -hmm. You're a very good negotiator. Thank you for training me well. I just want to get that out of the way. You got it. Um, you don't want to give any back, do you? No, thank you. I didn't think so. Uh, hey, Joel, listen. I want to thank you not only for being here with Mary and I on Lessons in Leadership, being a longtime friend, a board member of ours, a supporter of what we're doing at NJIT and innovating with you and your colleagues every day. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. I'm Steve. That's Mary. That's Joel. We'll be right back on Lessons in Leadership right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is brought to you by Gibbons PC, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, New Jersey Resources, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gamba. I want to thank Dr. Joel Bloom from NJIT for joining us on this edition of Lessons in Leadership. Mary, big picture. You and I talk a lot about crisis leadership, crisis communication. Uh, Mary and I spent about three or four years working on this book, which is not, again, our newest Lessons in Leadership. This is how many books ago? Three. Three, three books, books ago. I believe so. Um, I'm not trying to brag that I have five books. I'm just trying to make a point. This is Lessons, excuse me, what were they thinking? Crisis communication, the good, the bad, and the totally clueless. And by the way, this was written before social media was social media, meaning we wrote this book by doing case studies about how to handle a crisis, whether it's a public health crisis, coronavirus, doesn't matter what it is. But my sense is that the ability or the need to lead and communicate in a rapid but effective fashion in the age of social media. I mean, we, we actually did the Johnson & Johnson Tylenol case back in the 80s. Check the date if you could, Brian. I think it was late, late 80s. Yeah. Uh, here's the point. That case would have been totally different in the age of social media. A lot of cases where we said someone handled it well would have been totally different in the age of social media. How do you think leading and communicating in a, in a crisis or a difficult situation, public health or otherwise, is different because of social media? If done right, if done in an effective way and you're using social media to communicate a sense of calm, a sense of we've got this, a plan, it's great. In a sense of today, again, we're talking about coronavirus. And right now, the mass hysteria that's happening where people are going out and uh, just hoarding toilet paper and paper towels and cleaning supplies and masks and that type of information. By the way, we're taping on March 9th. Go ahead. Absolutely. And that kind of information, I feel, is very detrimental to the overall planning, the getting that information out there. So much is out there. You can't go into Twitter. You can't go into Facebook without seeing the latest case, the la latest issue, the latest um, news that's out there about the coronavirus. So if used properly and if used to share accurate, timely, relevant information, but unfortunately the opposite can happen and it creates hysteria, which is what we're seeing now. Yeah, but by the way, you have the date, Brian? 1982. Oh, that's scary. That is scary. That means. <laughs> that is really weird. Uh, 82 is Johnson Johnson. Are you ready for this? Here's, here's what I'm saying. Say an organization, we actually have a hospital executive uh, coming in a little bit later on to talk about how they're dealing with this as from a leadership and communication point of view. 
But here's the thing. You can do all the right things. You can communicate to your employees, communicate to your key stakeholders, communicate to your customers. Do it in a way that's responsible, that's timely, that's accurate, that's credible. But you can't control what's going on on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on God knows whatever social media platform. But that's the problem. That is that is what I'm saying, that the media, whether it's credible media or crazy media, they are taking this and they're running with it. Because well, how does it, excuse me, then how does it change the way you lead and communicate if, in fact, a leader of a corporation, organization, an institution of higher learning like Dr. Joel Bloom, they don't control that. They don't. Do they have to react to it then? They need to react to it. They also need to be careful of what they're saying because what they are saying can be excerpt. They, they can really take a smaller excerpt of what they're saying, and then it can be twisted and manipulated by the media. And the headline can read something as simple uh, as, you know, 50% of the population is going to get coronavirus, when that's not really what they were saying. It could say 50% of the most vulnerable citizens, 70 and over, will get the coronavirus. But if they tweak it a little bit, mm. that, I think, adds into hysteria. Stay on this. Mary and I both have uh, kids right now, uh, otherwise known as sons in this case, who are in high school. From a leadership and communication point of view, what pressure, again, whether it's coronavirus or any other public health situation, what is expected of leaders in public schools or any kind of school? We have one uh, kid, in, one son in, in a parochial school, one son in a public school. And it's different, by the way, because the rules are different, they're governed differently. But what are you looking for as a parent from the leaders of educational institutions in a public health crisis like sure. this. Sure. And it's it's really what I would be looking for in any type of crisis, but even with public health, because you do feel that could impact your child. What I'm looking for is consistent communication. A uh, minute left. This is interesting. Uh, the president, so far, again, don't know how it's going to play out, wanted to be very optimistic from the beginning. He has said consistently that we're going to get this under control. We have it under control. We're doing this really great. We're perfect in the way we're doing it. I don't care what your politics maybe. Should a leader communicate in a very positive, hey, we got this, or worst case scenario or something in between? I think something in between. I think a leader cannot be up there and say that the sky is falling because they are looking for the leader to be confident and in control. And we don't need people panicking. Exactly. But which you many do are wanna, already, but go ahead. You do want to acknowledge I am not a medical professional. If I were Donald Trump, I would say I'm not a medical professional. We have the best people on this. We will continue to keep you informed as this progresses. That's what you want. You want information, but you don't want false security either. Mm. You know what's so interesting as we close this show? This book, uh, What Were They Thinking?, which is not to be confused with lessons in leadership. Um, in many cases, I was very critical of CEOs who did not go out front, mm -hmm. who hid behind others in the organization. But when it comes to a public health situation, you want the experts who know best, who are closest to it. Especially when questions are involved. If yep. you have a reporter asking a question, Donald Trump can't answer. Oh, how contagious is this? How long does it live on no, surfaces? No, should he be expected to. Exactly. So he should back away. Back Sometimes away. leaders have to know enough. Leading is backing away to follow others who know better. Absolutely. Wow. Hey. Something else that you just learned from Lessons in Leadership. Mary, real quick, let's thank our funders who made this possible. We've got Prager Metis, we have Gibbons PC, we have uh, the International Union of Operating Engineers. What Local about Valley? Local Valley Bank. Bank. What about Valley? Yep. And um, who New Jersey Resources. Did I say them? Gibbons, Prager Metis, New Go Jersey ahead. Resources, Valley Bank, and International Union of Operating Engineers. Just saying thanks. Thank you. Uh, this has been Lessons in Leadership. Uh, thank you for listening to us on AM 970, all of our digital platforms, and to our audience on News 12 Plus. I promise we'll see you next Sunday at 10 a.m. Check out next time. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is brought to you by Gibbons PC, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, New Jersey Resources, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. When I started working with children with autism over 25 years ago, my mission began. Autism is a multifaceted spectrum condition, which challenges our system of standard norms. What autism has taught me is that there is no cookie cutter child. 
Our differences ought to be celebrated, not separated. So today, take a moment to say hi or smile at someone who might be a bit different. Acceptance starts with you.